Welcome to the second half of chapter 14. It was a strange thing to do, but Peter didn't pull away, didn't move a muscle, didn't even draw a breath. Because at that moment, her strong grip was the only thing keeping him from flying apart. Well, that's over now, isn't it? She said. She rose. I may not have your answers, boy, but I do know one true thing about you. You need food, a lot of food. You're 12, you've slept out in the cold, and you've got a bone to heal. I'm going to set that bone now. Then I'm going to start cooking, and you're going to start eating, and neither one of us is going to stop until you say so. Got it? Peter's belly was suddenly a hollow, snarling crater. Yes, ma'am, I've got it. Bola rummaged under the sink and drew out a sack of plaster. Peter watched her sift some into the bucket and then pump in some water. Then she brought over the things she'd been sewing. Foot up. Peter propped a pillow under his knee and worked a quilted sleeve over his leg, like an open-toed sock. He recognized the yellow-checked material. He glanced in the bedroom to be sure. You cut up your quilt? I can always make another one. You need the cushioning. She took another section of the quilt and stripped the batting off, then ripped into the yellow calico into strips and dunked them into plaster. Here, hold your foot at a 90-degree angle. Around and around his foot and ankle halfway up his shin, she wrapped the strips. When she built a thick boot, she frosted it more with the plaster. Don't move, not even your toes. Bola left for the porch and came back with her arms full. She set two iron skillets on burners, flipped a hunk of butter into each, and turned on the flames. She cracked a couple of eggs into a yellow bowl and started whisking them, then cornmeal. A cool breeze, fragrant with earth and frying butter, lifted against Peter. He looked at the sturdy cast drying, his foot safe inside now, wrapped in what used to be Bola's quilt. I'm sorry. About how I've been. He tipped his head to her bulletin board. My philosophy bingo cards, she said with a nod. No, Bat Peter, those are just things I figure to be true about the world, the universals. The important ones are the things I figure out to be true about me. I keep them somewhere else, private. How come? How come they're the important ones, or how come they're private? Peter shrugged. Either or both. He leaned back, waiting. Vola eyed him as she sawed off a piece of ham joint and forked it into one of the frying pans. She dipped out three ladles of batter, poured them sputtering into the other pan, and set the bowl down. I'm going to tell you a story. When I got out of the service, I didn't remember a single true thing about myself. That's what training does. No more individuals, just pieces they can mold to their machine. I was lost my first day as a civilian. Lost. I went into a grocery store. I stared at all the choices, but I kept wondering who I was supposed to be buying groceries for. What person, I'm sorry, what filled this person's hungry belly? Gumbo or pie? Beans or bread? In the produce aisle, I broke down because... I didn't remember a single thing about myself. Bola went quiet, her eyes closed. What happened? Peter nudged after a moment. What happened? In the store. What happened in the store? Oh. She turned back to the stove and flipped the Johnny cakes. Peanut butter. Peanut butter happened? Vola tossed her hands into the air. Peanut butter happened, and I was lucky it did. There I was on the floor of the grocery store, a dirty, red, and white checked linoleum, I will never forget, weeping. And I knew I couldn't get up until I remembered what kind of food I liked. Bola stacked the Johnny cakes on a blue plate, then paused. Peter thought she might be drifting back to the memory of that grocery store floor. He was glad he hadn't seen anything like that, a grown woman sobbing on a dirty grocery store floor, a crazy lady with one lost leg. He suddenly felt protective and hoped no one had laughed at her and that she had gotten herself out okay. And? Oh, and finally I did. I remembered my grandmother telling me that when I first discovered peanut butter sandwiches, I wanted one every day. So I got from the floor and I bought myself some peanut butter and bread. And I filled my cart with peanut butter and bread because I decided I wasn't coming back until I knew for sure something else I liked to eat. And I was afraid it might be a long time. She added the ham to the plate, slapped on a scoop of applesauce, and brought it over to him with a white with a white pitcher of maple syrup. Eat. Peter flooded the plate with syrup and loaded a fork. The cornmeal had a gritty crunch, 
The ham was smooth and salty against the sweet syrup. It was the best food he could remember eating. And was it? He asked when he cleaned half the plate. A long time before you remembered anything else? Vola pressed a finger to the drying cast. Almost set. Keep still a while longer. She went back to the stove and carved more ham and ladled more batter into the skillet. It was. People around me. They called it PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder from being in war. And they were right that I was sick. But I knew it wasn't from being in the war exactly. It was that in that war I had forgotten everything that was true about myself. Post-traumatic forgetting who you are disorder. That's what I had. My grandfather was in a nursing home by then and he was dying. And I went out to his place. It had been my old home too. My grandparents raised me for a couple of years to clean it out. And it was the end of summer. The orchard was an untended mess. But there were still some peaches hanging on. And that was the second lucky thing that happened to me after the peanut butter because I suddenly remembered, Lord, I love those peaches. I used to sneak out in the middle of the night to pick them. I'd sprawl in the grass underneath those trees with fireflies flashing all around. And Caddy did singing, a heap of peaches on my belly, and I'd eat them till the juice ran into my ears. I remember that so clearly. I could smell that memory. I could hear it. I could taste it. But I couldn't figure out how that girl could be the same person who had put on a uniform, picked up a gun, and done all the things that I did at war. So I reached up and picked one of those peaches, and I laid down the grass and bit into it, and, and there I was. I found another true piece of my old self. She brought the skillet over and stacked more Johnny cakes and ham onto his empty plate, and then went back to the stove. Stop. Stop? Well, that's the end of the story anyway. No, I mean, this will be enough food. Thank you. Peter wished again that his fox were under the table, wondered if Pax were hungry, and then had the curious sense that he wasn't. That tonight, at least, Pax had food in his belly. So then what? He asked after loading his fork. You were okay? Bola set the skillet in the sink and came back to sit across from at the table. What a person likes to eat? That's a detail. I was so lost I needed to find out all the true things about myself. The little things to the biggest of all. What did I believe in at my core? Peter figured he knew it was coming. Like war, now you're anti-war, right? Vola steepled her fingers under her chin. That's a complicated thing. What I am is for telling the truth about it, about what it costs. People should tell the truth about what war costs. It's taken me a long time to figure out. She leaned back, and that was just one thing I had to relearn, everything that was right and wrong for me. But I couldn't. The world was too loud for me to hear myself think, so I moved into my grandfather's place. I decided to stay here until I knew who I was again. Peter looked at the jarred peaches on the shelf above him, then recalling the blooming trees in the orchard. And you're still here, he said. This is that place, isn't it? See you in chapter 15.